stayed up to 10 o'clock in the morning last night. Don't be saying I'm just going to go there. Just keep playing for me, will you? It's only, it only makes it better. It only makes it better. I stayed up till 2 o'clock in the morning. Looking at a message, working on a word, man. And it is solid. It is such a good concrete word. We really need it. This church needs it bad. And I'm going to tell you, it was right at the last minutes before service started. I felt I felt like the Lord wanted to shift gears. Which, uh, I'm okay. Whatever God wants to do, it's fine with me. And uh, I've never done this word here, but I have done it. A variation of it at Covenant like a week, a month ago, or a month and a half ago. And uh, I just feel like God wants to revisit that right now. But maybe it's because this house doesn't know. Maybe it's because some of y'all haven't ever heard it. There's, it needs to fall on some of your plates. But um, go ahead and find Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. You don't have to stand yet. I want to I share with you a little bit about me for those that you don't that, that don't know. Let me tell you. You can just play for a minute and then it may, it may be that I'll have you play the whole time. Not really, but maybe, you know. Let me tell you about me, for those of you who aren't up to speed or for those that uh, are on the other side of the camera. When I come out of high school, I come out of it full throttle. I did pretty good in school, it's with the exception of not showing up in those times that I didn't get grades at all. Um, otherwise, when I was there, I did well. Hear how I use the word well? That ought to tell you. Huh? <laughs> but when I got out, I started doing dope. Well, one thing led to another quickly. Pot was just a gateway. That really is a gateway, maybe. Really, the truth is, anabolic steroids was the gateway. And then I went to pot, and then I went to cocaine, and then I went to crack, and then I went to meth, and then I went to pills, and I went to a lot of pills. Um, then I went to heroin, and uh, all of the acids, and all those type of things, and the mushrooms, just, there's no limit. <laughs> there was no limit, it was outrageous, it was out of hand. And, um, and I don't want to take you down this road for too long, because it's, it's not what's important this morning, I don't think. But I got into a place, man, where uh, I heard everybody I knew. I, I was living for me. I was doing what I could to come up so that I could fund getting high. That's all I wanted to do during the day was get high. Uh, getting high was a, 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 a way, in a sense, to escape. And it's sometimes more than an escape. Sometimes you actually do have pain. Sometimes you actually do feel something physically, which only makes it easier to make the decisions that you know you should make. So there I am. Um, I'm bound up in sin. I'm doing all kinds of dope. I'm robbing my family. I'm robbing stores. Man, I would go in stores. I would get a blowtorch and melt the bolts off the door and go in and, to get their safe. I wasn't a small-time criminal. Uh, I got over 90 felonies, um, and, and it shows. <laughs> if you look at my record, it's not, it's not even funny. So there was a time, man, where, and I want to skip a lot of steps, but I want to tell you, there was a time where I did a lot of wrong. I did a lot of hurt. I hurt a lot of people. Uh, I stole from a lot of places. I, I stole from a lot of churches. Uh, some of you that doesn't understand grace or actual born again experience might drop a jaw and never come back. But I came into churches. I took their instruments, all of which are mine here. So if you steal them, you're stealing from me, uh, except the bass. Uh, um, but I came in. I took everything I could find. The amps, the guitars. I would sell them. I would pawn them. I would go trade them for a crack rock for a seventh of their value and go and get high and then move on. I would come into another church, I would find the offering bag that they didn't always take with them and empty it out and take it with me and get high. But yet God had mercy. And I'm gonna tell you, it's true as the day is long. Uh, they gave me five and a half years when they should have gave me five and a half life sentences. I threatened to double it and give me 12 and add a year. Um, and none of that ever happened. I went to community corrections. I didn't stay. I left. I hopped the fence. I ran. Uh, when the police department knocked on my door, I ran from them too, and they didn't find me. I got away. Went to my grandmother's house one night, and uh, the sheriff's department showed up, in which I hid again, me and my gun in the closet, ready to kill the first person that opened the door. Uh, they didn't find me. I got away, and I ran, and I was on the run for a season. Uh, I was on the run during the time these two were alive, and. Uh, had no intention of looking back. I wasn't well pleased with the thought that I could never see family again or whatever else, but at the same time, I couldn't imagine the idea of 12 years. So I did a lot of crime and I had a lot of time hanging over me, but yet God had mercy. And I'm taking you somewhere, man, trust me. But there came a point in time in which uh, I felt like I needed to turn myself in. Family convinced me maybe you shouldn't be able to run forever. So I came. 
I'm driving down the interstate, I'm throwing my guns out, so I'm throwing things out that I don't want to pull up to the police department with. Um, and I get there and I turn myself in and they take me. Um, I have a court date that they put off for an extended period of time. Finally, I go to court and what they end up telling me is simple. They said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna double your time and out of year, you're not getting 12. In fact, we're gonna give you credit for all the time you were on the run. All you got left is two and a half years. When you go in, you do your two and a half years, you get out and, and that's that. That's a gift from God. <laughs> The society might say, that's just not right. But I'm still paying restitution and court costs until today. And I will pay restitution and court costs until the day I die outside of a million dollar lottery ticket or something. But I'm still paying for it. And I will pay for it because you reap what you sow. Right. But nevertheless, I don't have to reap the eternal consequences of what I've sown because one came into the earth to take away those consequences. So I went in, I did a year and a half, and I went up for parole. And the first time I made parole on my first occasion, which never happens, I got parole and went out and started getting high and drunk again for a, the whole year that I was on parole. Uh, and I skipped so many things. I'm not here to really talk about my past again. It's just not relevant in this moment that much. But know this. I know nobody that's done more wrong. I know nobody that's hurt more people. I've done way worse than you can ever imagine by dragging people to ATMs, putting guns in their heads, and having them empty out everything they had by beating up dope dealers, both male and female, to take their dope just because I had that many devils. That's what I was. I was outright demonic disgrace to the face of the earth. And yet I said GD every other word. I was a blasphemer. I was hateful. I was angry at anything that might seem like God or even appear to be God. I hated everything that might be called holy and wanted to live for me and wanted to get high. I challenged anybody and everybody that I ever came across to do something about it because I'm going to live for me and there's nobody ever going to change that. When the law came, I ran. When, when circumstance happened, I ran. When the courts came knocking, I ran. Nobody was changing my mind. So there came a point in time where I was really drunk one night, but I remember it so well. I was on pills and I was hammered drunk and I remember shaking a fist in heaven and looking to the sky. I literally was standing there in my apartment and I looked up and I said, if you're real, you're weak, kill me if you can. So that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. Listen closely because I'm taking you somewhere. Within hours, man, I'm laying on the couch, I'm starting to sober, I'm out of everything, I have no money, I'm just, I robbed until I don't know who to rob anymore. I literally robbed the same place so many times that they quit leaving stuff on the premises. I robbed them multiple times and then they learned a lesson finally. So I ran out of people were robbed. Um, so I'm laying there, I'm sobering up, at which point in time I feel a physical tap on my side. I feel that three times, an actual physical tap on my side. Uh, nobody's in there, so I think, and I hop up, I'm freaked out, I'm in a panic. I cut the, open the blinds, I cut the TV on, and on the TV is a man dressed like I dress, walking through the graveyard in the middle of the night, sharing the simple gospel, which I've never really heard or understood, at least. Never really heard it the way he taught it. And I'm going to tell you right now, man, I've looked for him. I've looked, I've done Google searches, I've tried to describe him, I've tried to find him, I've tried to find the station or anything that could, he does not exist. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I watched the guy all night long, the sun came up while I was watching this man talk about the gospel. I watched all night long him you know, share the simple gospel, and it was in that moment that I became concerned for the first time with whether or not I had committed blasphemy of the Holy Ghost because I said GD all the time, not realizing that that is not blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. I did not realize that that's what it was. The fact that my concern was evidence that I hadn't committed it. Um, so in that moment, I had a, a conviction. God was working on my heart. I didn't see the Lord that night, but I felt him tap me on the side. I felt the drawing in my heart. I felt the workings of the Holy Ghost toward a man that shook a fist at him just hours before that and called him weak. I felt the love of God and the grace of God pulling me in for some strange reason. And in that moment, I, I asked the Lord, point blank and plain and simple, I said, I don't know how to pray. First of all, there's my first acknowledgement that there must be a God because that's who I, I have to be dealing with right now. I don't know how to pray. But if you'll forgive me, I need it. Remember, every day, three, four hundred blasphemies took his name in vain. All the people I hurt and beat up and robbed and stole from, all the families, all the running, all the pain that I caused people. The challenging him, calling him weak, you name it. He comes, and what does he do? When I said, if I need, if you'll forgive me, I need it. 
And the moment that I said that, I felt multiple entities begin to leave my body. I felt demonic spirits, one after another, start to depart from me. And in that moment, I felt something slam back down into my chest. And instantly, I had a mindset of righteousness thinking, I need a Bible. Right now, I need a Bible. And all that was, let me tell you this, this, is God came and stretched out a hand to a disobedient and obstinate man. He is not a respecter of sin any more than he's a respecter of person. Why? Because God gave him who knew no sin to be sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God in him. That God sent him unto the earth to take away sin. And I promise you, the sufficiency of the blood of Christ is all the reason God needs to not ever bring up your sin again. So when he came to me, he didn't say, recall that adultery about the gun to that person's head. Hey, that was my son that you robbed. How about all those churches you went in and broke into? You're going to hell for forever. That's not what he said. He came and he extended mercy. I don't know about you, but I don't know how to deal with that. Being somebody as bad as I was for him to come and say, mercy unto you. I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. They're forgotten and I will remember them no more. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been forgiven of anything or have forgotten what you've been forgiven about, let me tell you this, that the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus Christ is absolutely enough to cancel once and for all everything that you've ever done and for him to not bring it up again. So I want to tell you right now, it doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter who you are, God is still saving. Colossians 3, go with me. You can quit if you want. But come back in like 30 minutes. <laughs> Colossians 3, I ain't got a lick of sense. That ain't even it. Go ahead and find Philippians 3. Colossians is awesome. It's one of my favorite, but it ain't going to get us there. It ain't going to get us there. Philippians chapter 3. They're side by side. My Bible's like one page apart, so that's what got me. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 7. I'm going to give you a thought. Never preached this here, but it's a recent message, and I feel inclined to, to visit it here. We've got people in the house, I'm not just pointing at you, but there's a handful of people here that uh, are never here. So this, this uh, I don't know where you stand or where you are, but it's a very well fall with anybody's plate. And I'm going to tell you this too, and I told him when I preached it, that this is not just for the lost. This is probably more so for the, uh, the saved that need a reminder of some things. Amen. So Philippians 3, 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. George is excited. Do y'all hear him back here? <laughs> Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but none that I may win Christ. And be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind um, and reaching forth of those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Pray Amen. for me. Father, we thank you for your grace and your love and mercy. Thank you for the word that you've already brought, Lord. We thank you for the seed that's been planted in the ears and hearts, God. We ask you, Lord, that the, uh, through Jared's preaching, God, that you'll speak through him and cultivate Amen. that word. Lord, that, uh, that our hearts will be enlightened and well, our minds and uh, just uh, we'll be quickened, God, to what you've done and the finished work of the cross. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. So this morning I'm going to go down the road and we'll see what happens because I didn't come here with this plan. Um, but I want to speak to you uh, a message that's formally titled already this one thing. And uh, I believe it's vital. I believe it's absolutely vital. If you're born again, if you're saved, it honestly falls on your plate first. But if you're lost, know and understand through the uh, pretenses of everything that the scriptures give us and what I'm fixing to tell you falls on your plate just the same. So I really believe it belongs to those who know Christ and it goes downhill from there. So if you would pay close attention, my prayer is that the Spirit of God will do a work in your minds and in your hearts through this morning that will bring forth change. 
So the text said, but this one thing I do, forgetting, look, that's the thoughts. He's talking about the thought line. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So the Apostle Paul, he's saying something that's point blank and it's clear. It's pretty obvious. He's saying that there's some things in his past, things that are good things and things that are bad things, things that are positives and things that are negatives, both of which he's going to make a conscious choice to forget for the purpose and for the reason of being able to press forward without any shackles or bondage. Paul's not only saying I've got a past that's decorated with a lot of issues and a lot of problems. He's also saying I've got enough of victories to where if I let that bind me and hold me in my past, then I'll never move forward. So I want to speak to you right now knowing this, that through the victories and through the failures, sometimes they might be a call to remembrance. So you can remember what God has done, but there's got to come a point in time in which the victories and the failures are laid down in the past and left in the past so that you can press forward into the high calling of Christ without bondage, without shackle, without shame, and move on in the calling of what God has called you to. Amen. I got through. I count. When I get an amen, I count them, and then I take notes. I write it down. I look at Ashton and say, where was your amen? <laughs> this is what he said to the Corinthian church he said take every thought captive take every thought captive and I'm going to tell you right now I believe and I've said this before that I believe Paul has a good awareness of what the psalmist said when he spoke about having your mind fixed on the Lord because as your mind is stayed on him you abide in perfect peace I believe Paul understood that and he knew that the mind would be the very end of somebody's walk if it is that they gave enough place to the thought processes that could bind them. I want to tell you this. When Jesus came and he took away your sin, he shed his blood on Calvary. He died a sinner's death for you. When he came, he came on behalf of you. And then he was imputed unto you in full righteousness. And now there is therefore now no condemnation for you if you're in Christ Jesus. But you know as good as I do that your mind might tell you otherwise and remind you of what you did yesterday and remind you of how it's been for the last three months and remind you of your failures and your faults and prevent you from ever pressing forward into the high calling. Forget those things which are behind. Simply means to not bring into remembrance. This rock is a rock of remembrance. Remembrance to a certain degree is vital. But when you bring it into the present and cause it to bind you and allow it to bind you, it's a stumbling block, not just a rock of remembrance. <laughs> Very good one. <laughs> I want to tell you, you cannot necessarily forget the things of your past. You can't necessarily erase them from your memory altogether. But what you can do is not allow them to control you by developing a proper understanding of what it is that Calvary ac accomplished for you so that you don't have to drag them through life in bondage. Amen. When the blood of Jesus is shed for a sinner, when the blood of Jesus is forever making intercession and it's crying out from the mercy seat on behalf of the people of God, when the blood of Jesus, which is still red and has never run dry, when it speaks on your behalf, do you suppose that God would like to remind you of your past once it's been applied? Or would that be infringing upon blasphemy? Because when we accept the very work of the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf, what we're saying by necessity is this. I cannot resurrect the things that have been buried, and I cannot recall into remembrance the things that he has forgiven, because I accept by faith the full atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ, and I refuse to stay in bondage when he has set me free indeed. Proverbs chapter 4, we're going somewhere. Don't know where, but we're going. It says, look your eyes. This is 425, Proverbs 425. Look your eyes. Let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. And I want to tell you, man, my past is a past that, that, that can't be forgotten. The extensiveness of it, it would take me literally multiple days to tell you everything I've done if we were to sit and pick it apart. 
And I can sit and recall all of the meth that I burned. And I can sit and recall all the crack that I passed out on because it was too much. I can sit and recall all the heroin that I snorted. I can sit and recall when one of these were being born, going into the bathroom of the hospital, laying a whole line of meth out, not even crushing it, and snorting it in my head because I had to be high all the time. But I'm going to tell you this. I will not forget what Calvary has done and just assume because I have the capacity in my humanity to fail God every now and then that that blood is suddenly not enough to deliver me from my shame and my sin. I'm telling you, there's no distance, there's no valley, there's no height, there's no depth, there's no breadth, there's no length, there's absolutely nothing that's going to separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus your Lord. Amen. Do you believe it? Do you believe it in, in doctrine only or do you believe it so much that you're not bound in your past? Jesus single-handedly by himself atoned for your sin. He didn't ask for your input or your help. He asked for one thing and that's have faith in the work that he's done. How can you have faith if you're holding yourself in bondage to what you did? You cannot change not even a bit of the past. You can't change the color of your hair. You can't change where you've been, what you've done. Let me tell you something. How many of you got kids? How many of them could run away for a year and a half and be perverted dope heads that are killing people and the worst thing you can think of possible to where it would ever drive you to the place where you didn't want to come have them come back so you could hold them and nourish them and say, I love you. I'm not mad at you. I forgive you. It is forgotten. It's the past. I put it away. How many of you would ever watch your kid walk away and not ever stand there with your arms wide open hoping that they would come back? I'm telling you, Calvary is the arms wide open of God Hill himself. He is the answer. He is the one. And because of that, your past is the past. And that's where it needs to stay. Amen. Listen. In the Old Testament, we spoke of types and shadows. And i got to go to this road to make it make sense. And we look at the appointed times of God because we know of their importance. And we know that when Jesus comes a second time here very soon, that he's coming apart from sin unto salvation. To fulfill his fall feast. So we, we at least have a recognition of those appointed times. And we look at them when we watch them and we observe and we, and you name it. But the day of atonement was just a matter of six, eight weeks ago. I don't know how long. I don't even know what day it is. I forgot those that are behind. So I don't even know what day it is now. <laughs> anyway, the day of atonement was just not long ago. And through that, we can call, we're called into remembrance the work of Christ. Everything in the Old Testament is a type and shadow that points to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, every sacrifice that was made points to Christ. Every dove, every bull, every goat, every lamb, everything points to Jesus Christ. He is the eternal sacrifice that's accepted on behalf of you and I. So what you see there, and even the motions and the, the mechanics of what they did in the temple, all of that points to Jesus in one way or another. So it's important that we understand what we're looking at. But on the day of atonement, I want to give you the skinny as fast as I can. Because I don't want to hold you. It's probably time to go. It's going to be a late lunch. Listen, somebody needs this. I didn't come here with this. I know that God was giving me this. And I'm like, oh, Lord, it's for you. See, look, so there's one. If for one only, how many of you know he would leave the 99 and chase her down all by herself? Because that's how good God is. On the day of atonement, there was a high priest, and he would go into the tabernacle. How many of you know that Jesus is our high priest? And he would go into the tabernacle, and he would do the work of redemption that nobody else could do. Everybody else had to wait outside, but the high priest would go in, and he would do a work that he alone could do. You could not help him with it. You had to wait. Amen. But there were two goats that we talked about. One of those goats would be laid down as a sacrifice, his blood would be shed. The other goat the Bible refers to as the scapegoat in which your sin would be placed upon its back. At that point in time, they would lay hands on that goat and confess the sins of the people of God. And then they would release that goat into the wilderness. And it was to carry those sins into the wilderness and never return. Listen. 
the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. The Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood which was given unto us upon the altar to make an atonement for our soul. But the second goat, I want you to think about the responsibility of this second goat, both of which point to Christ. The sacrifice and the scapegoat, they point to a type of Christ. The first goat shed its blood. It was to make an atonement for the soul. Its blood was shed and that was accepted when the high priest alone went in and did the work. But the second goat is that that scapegoat, they would lay hands on it and send it away with the sins of the people upon its back. What does that mean? That scapegoat is the very evidence that once you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, that God is expecting you to take your sin and to lay it upon the back of that scapegoat and to descend it away and to never revisit it again. I say, God shed his blood. One goat had to die, but the next goat is to take upon him your sin and to be taken out into the wilderness never to return again. And I want to tell somebody in this house know this. You believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood has been shed for you. The high priest, the king of glory came in and he did the work of yearly redemption that only he could do. But then there comes a point in time in which even though the blood was shed you've got to decide that the second goat is going to do what the second goat is called to do. In which you lay your sin upon its back and send it out to the wilderness and never revisit it again. I'm telling you, God has let his son lay his life down for you. And when that blood was shed, God was expecting for you to let your sin go. Amen. In a moment's time, it literally takes an instant to repent and believe and the blood wash you and you're forgiven. That's right. The most rotten person I've ever met is standing here with the mic. And yet God had mercy. <laughs> He didn't ask me to jump to the first hurdle. He didn't ask me to recall anything of the past. He didn't want to sit and discuss when I broke into this place or to that place. He didn't want to ask anything about how much money I stole from a church to pay for crack rock. He didn't want to talk about any of that. Let me tell you why. Because his blood is sufficient. And the very moment that I asked him to forgive me of my sin, the very instant I said, I believe you're enough. I know I've been an idiot. I know I've done some things I shouldn't do. It's the very instant that God looks me in the eye with the very love of heaven and says, now then let your sin go and don't remember it anymore. I want you free indeed. Don't hold yourself in bondage. Just one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto the things which are ahead. Folks, I'm talking to the church. It'd probably be a good idea if we stopped holding ourselves in bondage and let go of the past. It'd probably be a good idea if we actually really did believe, because real belief would say the blood is enough. And then it would lay that sin on the back of that goat and watch it walk away. I know what it's like to remember yesterday. I know what it's like to recall the time where I got off work and decided I was going to get a 22 and drink it on the way home instead of honoring God. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to call my sister and ask her if there's any slim chance she's got an oxycodone because I'm in pain, knowing good and well that I'm going to get three or four instead of one because I've got an itch in there that I'm refusing to reconcile. But I also know what it's like to recognize my depravity and say, God, I see what the high priest has done. I see that the blood was shed. It's hard for me to accept, but I'm choosing by faith to call it mine. And in the moment that I do, when I make a conscious decision to take my past, every oxycodone, every beer, every heroin, every meth, and lay it on the back of that sin and give him a little nudge so he'll run away, to never chase him down and pursue my sin and try to bring it back into remembrance and bring myself back into bondage and bring myself back into a place where I'm healed up by something that God has forgiven. Amen. It's like the man was on top of that. But you... Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Amen. How many of y'all have ever been revisited by your past? How many of y'all have ever had to recall unto remembrance the things that held you in bondage in the past? 
How many of y'all passed to six hours ago and you're still wondering if God's blood was enough? How many of y'all know? Tell me. How many of y'all know that your sin is so recent that it's hard to forgive, but yet the blood of Jesus never runs dry? I said, how many of y'all know that the old covenant says that his mercy is new every morning, but the new covenant says his mercy is perpetual. It never ends. And I'm going to tell you that right now there's mercy. And right now there's mercy. And right now there's mercy. You might have walked into this house high as a kite. And I'm going to tell you right now, right now is mercy. And if you would believe upon the one who God has sent, and then send your sin away on the back of that goat, I'm telling you, you shall be set free indeed. I want to ask the same questions I asked before because it's important to note. What did God's people do when they were delivered from Egypt? They pressed forward. If you can recall the story, how many of you know that that story was not a perfect story? How many of you know there was ups and downs, ignorant choices, ignorant things said, ignorant things done, but a son is a son. You can debate sin with me all you want to, but you cannot debate sonship with me. <laughs> you cannot debate inheritance with me when you're family, you're family. And I'm going to tell you, I don't care how black you think your soul is right now, if you've ever been loved of God and His blood has washed you at any point in time in your life, whether it was 30 years ago or 10 minutes ago, I'm going to tell you because of that in an instant, you were received as a son of God. He loves you. You were brought into the household of faith. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's not forgotten your name and He would like for you to send your sin away so that you're not minded. I don't know if anybody's hearing me right now. This is a big deal. Let me tell you why it's a big deal. Because Jesus' blood can do all that Jesus' blood can do. And it can wash you into where you're not in bondage anymore. But you can hold yourself captive through remembrance of things that you can't change. What are you going to do about yesterday? How are you going to fix what you did a week ago? What approach are you going to take to take away all the dope you did? What approach are you going to take to take away the check that you forged out of mama's purse to pay for? What approach are you going to take to atone for it? Can you fix it? Can you change it? Can you take it away? Can he fix it? Can he change it? Can he take it away? Is he waiting until another time? Or was it when the fullness of time had come? God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Is the fullness of time now? Has Christ come? Has he come to take away your sin? Is he enough? He's either enough or he ain't enough. If he is enough, then let's take a good look at that second goat. Take the shame of that sin. Take the shame of yesterday. Take our past to lay it on its back and say, now you get gone because I'm walking on as a son of God and I'm not going to be held in bondage. Not one more day. Amen. Yeah. Isaiah 43. Remember not the former thing. Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Amen. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Now, when? Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Anybody in the desert that needs a springing forth, that needs a now new thing from God, I don't need your hand, but I will need your body up here at the end of this service. And I'm going to tell you this. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the great high priest who has sat down at the right hand of glory, whose enemies are his footstool. Hebrews 8, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Who believes that? Does that only apply to the sins from 10 years ago? Does that only apply to the sins before you got saved? Does that apply to the sins of yesterday? Does that apply to the sins of now? Does it?
I love to ask this question because it, it's pointed. What does the Bible say about David? The one who killed Uriah to snag his wife and to have a baby with her. What's the Bible say? It says that he fully followed the Lord. How do you fully follow the Lord if you've committed adultery and murder and all the other things that he's done? How do you fully follow the Lord? I'm going to tell you how. Because he forgot those things which were behind. That he refused to forget that his Redeemer liveth as he heard from Job of old. He refused to let somebody tell him that the blood of the first goat wasn't enough and that that second goat, when it ran away, it didn't actually run away. He understood what the atonement looked like. He understood the work of both goats. And I want to challenge you to get a good look at the work of both goats because this is why. One of them shed its blood, the innocent for the guilty. I don't care who you are or what you've done. It shed its blood, and if God has received it, then he's received it. There's nothing you can do to change it. What you do need to do now, though, is go to the second goat and say, Look, I've been holding on to this long enough. That one died for me, and I'm not holding myself in bondage another day. I know this is a lot for you to bear, but I'm going to lay my sin upon you, and I'm going to need you to run away with it because I don't want to remember it anymore. It's holding me captive, and I'm going to tell you the blood of Jesus Christ is the very reason you're free indeed. And if you've trusted in him this morning, you shall find life. There's no middle ground. There's no fixing this any other way. You'll hold yourself captive in bondage for the rest of your life if you allow it to happen. The enemy will stay in your ear and remind you of what you've done. And if you don't recognize what that goat has done, then all you're going to see is what you have done. And I'm going to tell you, that goat has done far more than I've ever done in sin. I'm going to tell you, the grace of God far outweighs the sin of man in every possible way. And if we believe the part of him, I'm telling you, it is enough. I don't think I'm going to do the whole message because it's a long one. I feel like we need to just pray it. The message is very simple. Give me your worst sin and watch the blood of Jesus mock it. <laughs> Give me the worst thing you've ever done. And let's watch the terror of the Lord come upon the enemies of your soul. I want to speak to you right now. I want you to hear me. For God so loved you. Can you play that? Like all my hallelujah, hallelujahs or yours or something song you played before? You don't have to sing it yet, but I don't know. I don't even know that one either. It's the first. I don't know where she's listening to, but I've never heard any of those tracks. But that's fine. It's, I'll sing unto the Lord a new song. Believe me. Everybody knows. Please. I like this. I'm into it. I like change. I'd rather stand up here like a novel and have no idea what I'm playing. But, uh, you know, I like it. God so loved you. That's not benevolent, empty talk. That's not just scripture that only belongs to some. That's not dependent upon your sin or your lack thereof. It has nothing to do with anything that was based upon your merit and everything to do with the fact that God so loved do you see anywhere in there it says God so loved because? Where does it say God so loved? Jesus is the because. But the Bible makes that explicitly clear. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now that the wrath of God was fully pacified. On your behalf because of Jesus Christ. And now if you can trust in him, that sin is put away. I don't know why you're all here. I know why one of you is here. I'm going to tell you point blank. It's not any more remembered in God's mind. And it isn't any of ours who don't know anything about it. The only mind that's having a hard time letting it go is in that seat right there. I'm going to tell you this. That God so loves you. The magnitude of your depravity, no matter how far you've gone, I'm talking to everybody. No matter what you've done in the secret place, no matter what you've said or spoken to God, no matter the rebellion, 
whether turning your back on him and running from him. I'm telling you, you cannot make the list bad enough to where God isn't ready to fix it and to cause you to move on. But understand this, no amount of blood is going to ever take away your sin if you're going to hang on to it in bondage. It's going to bind yourself and keep yourself hemmed up, unwilling to be loose and walk in freedom in life. You're never going to walk in freedom in life as long as you disregard the second go. Understand, the blood is enough. It is enough to atone for every last sin that you've ever committed in your entire life. And I want to tell you, through that blood, the one who shed his blood, he's got a Holy Ghost that he would like to fill you with afresh, with a new fire and a new flame. But I want to tell you at the same time, you're going to make it as far as your mind lets you make it. And it's imperative this morning that we understand that that second ago was more than enough to carry away our sin to the uttermost. As far as the east is to the west and to the sea of forgetfulness. That reminds me of Acts chapter 26. I believe I mentioned it before. When Paul was in the storm and his men were in the storm, they were getting rocked. Their boat was getting destroyed. They were getting beaten to the right, beaten to the left. And they were in a bit of a concern. The Bible says that they took cords and they began to wrap the boat. They began to undergird it. So in case they ran aground, it wouldn't destroy the ship. The Bible says that those cords are typological of the love of God. That you are bound by the love of God with cords of love. Amen. The Bible also says that they went they took the tackle and they took the gear and they took the cargo. And they started to throw it overboard because it was weighing them down. And they did that to lighten the load. And this is the point. There comes a point in time in which your boat gets rocked. Every now and then stupid things happen and you nearly shipwreck your faith to the point where you think there's no hope for you. And there's got to come a point in time in which we decide I'm going to be bound one more time with the love of God. I'm going to let Him hold me. I'm going to let Him receive me. And what else am I going to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to take that tackle. I'm going to take that cargo. I'm going to take these things that are weighing me down and I'm going to throw them overboard to lighten the load. Why? Because it's imperative that I forget those things which are behind me and press forward into the high calling of Christ. I'm going to tell you now, man, shipwreck is as near as any other day. You can face it. Things happen. Problems happen. Trouble comes. These things are a reality. But you do not have to go into a place of destruction. You don't have to die and stay dead. You don't have to lay down and lay down for good. Rise up in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the love of God hold you. Believe that the first goat is enough. And then take a hold of the back of the head of that second goat. And say, now take my sin as far as you can take it. Because I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I'm not going to live in bondage. The Lord ain't mad at you. The Bible says that Christ canceled the record of death that stood against us. And his legal demands. And nailed them to the cross. And it's through his blood that we have redemption and forgiveness of our trespasses. According to the riches of his grace. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for you. That you might be the righteousness of God in him. For if when we were enemies. We were reconciled to God. Through the death of his son. Did you hear it? If. When. We were enemies. When? We were enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. I got a hunch that everybody in the building can speak alongside of Paul and say, when we were enemies. That there's nobody in the building that's not at least believed the gospel in some fashion. You were an enemy. It was a thing of the past. But you've been made reconciled to God through the death of his son. And now, all you're left with, if anything, is the memory of the things that you have the capacity to fail God in. God is not measuring you based upon your failure. He's measuring you based upon your faith in the one who cannot fail. Amen. He's measuring you by the measuring rod of Christ. He is the plumb line. It can't be circumstantial. It can't just be a matter of when things are good and when things are bad. If it's Christ, it's Christ all day long. If you're a child of God, you've been made a co-heir with Christ. And through that now, you're seated with him. And there's therefore now no condemnation for you. I'm telling you, Enoch is an outright fool most days, almost every day. But he's still a son. 
Every diaper he takes off when it's full of turds. Every cracker he grinds up in the couch. Every Capri Sun he turns upside down in the chair. Every you he flips over on my carpet. He's still a son. And after I bust the back of that son's leg, I go back in three minutes and say, I love you. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Because you're my son. I love you. I'll never leave you. I'm not abandoning you. I forgive you. Your sins are gone. How much more then, you being evil, if God can give unto you such grace upon grace, how much more then the love of the Lord God Almighty upon you and to you through His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to spin my wheels. I'm going to tell you, man, it's one thing to forgive somebody else, and that can be easy. That's easy, I think. It's another thing to forgive you. Forgive yourself. Give yourself. I'm going to read to you one more verse and then we'll quit. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Does anybody here not believe God is for you? Does anybody really believe that God's not for you? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. It's God that justifieth. What did he do when the prodigal son went off down the road and lived like a fool and finally came home? What did he do? Did he beat him down? No, he said, somebody go get the best one I've got in my flock and lay that down as a sacrifice for their sin so we can have a party because I've got a bed for my son. I've, been, I've had made up the whole time he was gone just waiting on him to come back. Somebody get the party going because my son is home. He never said nothing about the adultery. He never said anything about the riotous living. He never said nothing about the drinks and the drugs. He said, my son is home who was dead but is alive again. He was lost but he is found again. Go and make merry. Let's get the party rolling because He's come home. No strings attached. The only string is red in the blood of Jesus. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Take tribulation for good. Distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Lord, I don't know if you forgot it on purpose, but it's not there. He never mentioned you. There ain't but one entity separating anybody from the love of God, and it's you, your own mind, your own past, your own thoughts. God ain't doing it. His people, his, his angels, his love, none of you can't name anything other than your own mind. I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any creature shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If God ain't doing it, why are we? I'd say it's time some of us get a hold of that second go and let him do his job. Seriously. I'm not going to say anything as we pray.